Hi, everyone, and welcome to the talk on antibiotic prescribing in uh, geriatrics. So yes, antibiotics is probably the third most commonest uh, drug that you'll prescribe an elderly patient. And so over the centuries, safe and effective use of antimicrobial therapy um, has kept this vulnerable population healthy, and we've prevented a lot of morbidity and mortality as a, as a, as a result of infection. So, um, can you see my? So, um, the uh, importance of this presentation is to go through some physiological changes, but also various pathophysiological. Uh, changes that you commonly encounter in the elderly population and how these affect your pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics of antibiotics in particular. So before we get into that, we know our geriatric population is at particular risk of infections, and this is a result of a combination of factors, mainly immunosenescence, multimorbidity, functional impairment, cognitive impairment, and of course, we know our, many of our elderly patients have a high prevalence of foreign material, such as prosthetic devices, artificial valves, and urinary catheters. And if you're an elderly person living in a communal residence or in a social institute, you're definitely at a higher risk of acquiring as well as transmitting multi-drug resistant organisms. So there's not a lot of studies looking at the drivers of inappropriate antibiotic use in elderly but I found this one from the Journal of American Geriatric Society. And it shows that many of the problems with antibiotics are, uh, is with us, the prescribers. So it has to do with our beliefs. Sometimes we take up the approach that it's better to be safe than sorry. So we start antibiotics early. The time pressures, it's easier to um, uh, start an antibiotic than explain to the family and, and to the patient um, why you don't need one at the moment. Um, and then lack of familiarity with the patient. I think this is a particular problem in our hospitals where the same patient is seen by different doctors at uh, different uh, days. So we really don't know what's normal for that patient. And then of course, increased medical complexity, that's a common problem in the elderly population. So we always anticipate a decompensation in the light of sepsis. So we rather start antibiotics. And of course, communication barriers is a problem. If, you, if your patient has cognitive problems, it further impairs or in, uh, makes it difficult for you to localize the infection. And um, other concerns such as poor follow-up and patient satisfaction scores are of concern. Um, so if the challenges are not with, within ourselves, the prescribers, that there are also challenges around the diagnosis of infection in an elderly population. So we know the older persons present with non-specific signs and symptoms, and such as increased confusion, falling, and anorexia. And these definitely don't have a high positive predictive value for infection in itself. Of course, the term older is colder is very prevalent here. Older and even frail uh, adults have decreased basal body temperature. And we know only 30 to 50% of patients actually present with a fever in, even in the setting of a serious infection. And there are some studies that look and show that only 60% of all the patients present with leukocytosis in the face of infection. And finally, not the use of non-steroidals because many of our older patients are on them for their musculoskeletal conditions. And it's shown that non-steroidals have um, or can impair or alter the inflammatory response. And certainly uh, diagnostic tests such as chest X-ray and urinary uh, dipsticks have a low predictive, uh, positive predictive value in the elderly population compared to that of the, of the younger patients. And of course, the lack of clinical signs and symptoms altogether further narrows the fine line between colonization and infection and therefore leads to a higher suspicion of infection, and hence we start or intend to use antibiotics commoner. So I don't think my talk will be complete if I didn't mention asymptomatic bacteriuria. It's very prevalent in the geriatric population. It's found in about 50% of community-acquired individuals, 75% of nursing home residents, and even up to 100% of those with a permanent indwelling catheter. So there's a lot of abundance of information and literature out there to show that there really is no measurable benefit to either screening or providing antibiotics 
for patients with this condition, e even if they're living in a community or in a long-term care facility. So certainly we are moving away from the ancient old you know, nursing practice where the Sunday afternoon ward rounds is dedicated to urine dipsticking everyone in the ward. And I believe this is sometimes even conducted in some of our wards even today. So when do you suspect an infection in an elderly person? And unfortunately, there's not enough guidelines, but these are recommendations from the Infectious Diseases Society of America, which says that if you find a new or an increasing decline in functional status, meaning mainly confusion, incontinence, falling, uh, deterioration in mobility, reduced food intake, or even failure to cooperate with the staff, and or if you prime the presence of fever as defined as a single oral temperature of more than 37.8 or a repeated persistent oral temperature of more than 37.5 or an increase in temperature of more than 1.1, then certainly this doesn't mean that you need to start empiric antibiotics, but at least it prompts you to look thoroughly for an infection. I think the consequences of inappropriate antibiotic use is all too familiar to us. And uh, of course, the development of multi-drug uh, resistant organism carries a high mortality and morbidity in the elderly population. Antibiotic related complications, uh, especially C. diff associated diarrhea, we know 80% of those who die from C. diff are those aged 65 and above. And of course, there are important side effects and adverse drug interactions that uh, are important that I'll come to just now. So as I said, I will go through some physiological and pathophysiological changes that affects pharmacokinetics. Just wanted to iterate here is that the physiological changes per se does not affect how you dose antibiotics. For it, so that if you follow the basic rules of um, dosing an antibiotic according to body weight and renal function, your dose and your intervals are most likely going to be okay. However, if you have issues such as concomitant um, a drug to disease or drug to drug interactions, or if you um, dose according to a total body weight and not lean uh, body weight, or uh, if you're not using creatinine clearance as, as a guideline, then you can run into trouble with dosing and bioavailability. So let's start with absorption. As we age, there's a decrease in gastric acid production, as well as decreased gastric motility, decrease small bowel surface area, as well as a decrease in splanchnic blood flow. However, these um, um, uh, conditions have not really been deemed of clinical importance, and they really don't have uh, an effect on the dosage of antibiotics you would use in an elderly population. However, when you're encountered with a drug-to-drug interaction, for example, the use of antacids or calcium channel, uh, sorry, cal uh, calcium carbonates, or even drug to disease interactions commonly are um, a chlorhydria, which is found in an elderly population or more prevalent in the elderly population, you might affect the bioavailability of antibiotics such as azithromycin and even clarithromycin. The next one is uh, distribution. So as we age, there's an age-related um, increase in the proportion of adipose tissue, which can then affect your lipophilic antibiotics uh, in by increasing their half-life as they become more readily soluble in tissue compartments. And here, antibiotics that are of concern is rifam rifampicin, fluoroquinolones, and macrolides and tetracyclines, amongst others. Um, concomitantly, you might have a decrease in your lean body mass, even up to 15%, as well as decrease in total body water. And this can affect your water-soluble antibiotics as... Um, they become um, less uh, soluble and you have an increased plasma concentration of antibiotics such as aminoglycosides, glycopeptides, and even uh, beta-lactams. I just wanted to mention some drug to disease interactions. So uh, diseases such as congestive cardiac failure or, or uh, cirrhosis, you can end up with uh, higher volumes of fluid accumulation at the site of infection. So this can potentially dilute the standard doses of your antibiotics. At the same time, the conditions such as malnutrition, proteinuria, sarcopenia, and liver diseases can decrease your plasma protein or albumin uh, levels, 
and therefore result in, in, in an increase in your free concentration of antibiotics in your plasma. And it can be a particular problem in antibiotics such as your acidic antimicrobials, mainly penicillin, keftriaxone, uh, and sulfonamide, as well as clindamycin. Metabolism. So there's an age-related decrease in your phase one enzyme activity, mainly cytochrome 450. And I think the biggest problem here can arise with the use of polypharmacy. So with polypharmacy, drugs become or become, uh, starts to compete for, for cytochrome 450 and hepatic enzymes, and that can result in increased half-life of metab uh, hep hepatically metabolized antibiotics mainly macrolides as well as fluoroquinolones. Certainly by no doubt, um, renal clearance remains the most important factor affecting antibiotic uh, levels. We know creatinine uh, clearance drops by one mil per minute per year after the age of 30. So that equates to more or less 7.5 moles per minute every decade of life. So it really becomes important to carefully uh, dose adjust uh, to maintain efficacy and minimize toxicity. Um, and the, the drugs that I've involved, uh, I have mentioned here. And of course, I think the golden question is, you know, which um, uh, formulary do you use um, to estimate your EGFR? Unfortunately, there is no expert accordance on the formula that's best estimates creatinine clearance in an elderly patient. And we know each one of them have their own limitations. And we know that in one study showed by M, that showed that uh, about equations from the MDRD as well as the CKD epidemiology collaboration equations can sometimes overestimate creatinine clearance, especially those with severe renal impairment. So the recommendation is if you are on using a nephrotoxic drug, especially in a patient with severe underlying renal impairment, it's best to directly measure the creatinine clearance in order to avoid drug toxicity. So it's not a, a whole lot of data out there with regarding the correct dose of antibiotics, but this is uh, three studies looking at merely meropenem and levofloxacillin, particularly in the elderly population with varying degrees of uh, chronic CKD, and, and they're able to give us various recommendations of the, of the respective antibiotics here. So does the route of administration really matter? And sometimes it can. So oral antibiotics, we know um, they're not the best for critically ill patients. And also compliance in an, a patient with advanced dementia can be of concern. We know dysphagia is a common problem in the elderly population. And there can, in some uh, reports, there can be an instance or prevalence of 27% in those aged above 75 years. So instead of using tablets and capsules, we might have to make the utilization of solutions and suspensions for their antibiotics doses. Um, when it comes to IVI administration, there's an increased risk of skin tears and hematomas in the elderly patients, especially if they're on antiplatelet or anticoagulation therapy. So certainly we advocate for the transition from IV to oral formula formulation as soon as possible. Um, IVI administration, yes, we can give the various antibiotics mentioned here as I, sorry, IMI, and it allows for administration at home and early discharge from a hospital. But again, the side effects such as hematomas and abscesses, then certainly IMI injections can be quite painful and that can affect your compliance. So when it comes to adverse events, yes, the older perk. Uh, persons are at increased risk, especially because of their multimorbidity, polypharmacy, and the variations in the pharmacokinetics that I've mentioned before, uh, earlier. So there's a whole list of um, common antimicrobial-induced events in the elderly population. Uh, we know that elderly uh, patients are at increased risk of hepatotoxicity from antitubiculous antibiotics, but I just wanted to go through one or two important ones. So the one is fluoroquinolones. So fluoroquinolones are um, considered safe and a well-tolerated antibiotic, and age per se does not seem to decrease tolerability. However, there are some special considerations to be taken um, into thought. So 
Um, for example, QT prolongation and arrhythmia is seen more commonly in patients who have severe underlying cardiac disease, or if they're on concomitant uh, QT prolongation agents such as class 1A or class 3 antiarrhythmics, as well as those who have electrolyte disturbances, particularly low magnesium and low potassium. Um, so uh, certainly in this gr uh, group of patients, we should re restrictively use fluoroquinolones. Some studies have shown that aortic aneurysms and di dissections are two to three fold higher in the elderly population. And um, tendon ruptures, yes, or older patients are at increased risk. And just to note, it can occur even several months after the withdrawal of a fluoroquinolone. Uh, the ones that are commonly implicated are ofloxacillin and ciprofloxacillin. Central nervous system complications are, uh, with fluoroquinolones are not that common, uh, but the patients that are at risk are those who have underlying uh, CNS pathology or even increased uh, atherosclerotic diseases. The mechanism here is thought that it, uh, fluoroquinolones displace GABA from its receptors. And um, symptoms can vary from, or side effects can vary from anxiety, insomnia, all the way to psychosis and seizures. Linozolid. So this one study showed that uh, the uh, oral, sorry, the concentration of linozolid uh, can be three times higher in patients aged above 80 uh, than compared to someone who's under the age of 40. And this is also affected again by renal dysfunction. The most common uh, side, uh, side effects found in elderly patients uh, is blood dyscrasia and uh, mainly thrombocytopenia and anemia, but it all depends on your baseline uh, platelet count as well as the duration of your therapy. I think the vestibular toxic side effects of aminoglycosides can be particularly devastating in the elderly patients and age is certainly uh, an important risk factor amongst others. I just wanted to mention a couple of other that I've mentioned here, the other neurotoxic side effects, but in particular, just be aware that gentamicin has, is a potent neuromuscular blockade function, and that can be a particular problem in patients in myasthenia gravis. So neurotoxicity or neurotoxic antibiotics, it's all rare to develop neurotoxicity on antibiotics, and it's often unpredictable and can be potentially dangerous in the elderly population. So some of the high risk classes I've mentioned here, just wanted to touch on gabapentin. So the most commonly implicated antibiotics is imipenem. The prevalence can be anywhere from 1.5 to 2%. And this is because imipenem can antagonize the GABA receptors. And of course, those at high risk are the ones with pre-existing central nervous system diseases such as strokes, infection, seizures, and advanced age seems to be a particular risk factors as well as renal dysfunction. Often the neurotoxic uh, symptoms are seizures and or seizure-like activity. And, um, but even though delirium and psychosis can also be implicated in uh, the use of ertapenem as well as meropenem. So drug to disease or drug or antibiotic to disease and uh, interactions in the elderly are common. So I've mentioned or highlighted a couple of important ones or the ones that we commonly use. Uh, again, just wanted to touch on one or two important ones. Uh, this is from the American Geriatric Society uh, on the De Beers criteria um, in 2019. And they have mentioned to avoid the use of warfarin with macrolides, especially azithromycin or warfarin and bactrim, because this uh, can increase the risk of bleeding in the elderly population. How it works is that warfarin and the use of these antibiotics can inhibit cytochrome 450 um, to C9, or as well as it can decrease your uh, vitamin K producing bacteria in your gut and hence prolong the activity of warfarin. DOACs are no exceptions to drug interactions. For example, the use of dibigitran and rif rifambicin. We know uh, rifambicin is a potent glycoprotein P transporter inducer. So um, dibigitran uh, uh, concentrations can increase, leading to increased risk of bleeding. Likewise, with rivaroxaban and the use of clarithromycin, erythromycin, and rifambicin, um, because rifambicin is a strong uh, CYP3A4 inducer, you get significantly lower uh, rivaroxaban plasma concentration. 
increasing your risk of clotting. And finally, just to mention linozolid. So the serotonin side effects uh, uh, with the use of linozolid and SSRIs, tricyclic antidepressants, or even SNRIs. So, so it's the incidence here of S serotonin syndrome is relatively rare and largely idiosyncratic. However, um, linozolid, you know, who you decide to, to put on linozolid is of importance. For example, if you have an elderly patient with advanced dementia who's living alone and on a high dose of an SSRI, uh, that's probably not a good candidate uh, as dependent on a person, for example, uh, on tramadol and has a good uh, family or a caregiver taking care of the patient. So um, just to inform your patients of the various clinical presentations of serotonin syndrome and when they should present to, a, to, the, to the doctor or to a hospital. So a final a slide. So what's the way forward when you look at antibiotics in an elderly population? And hopefully with this presentation, we've looked through some patient-related and treatment-related factors. Always uh, try and dose your antibiotics according to lean body weight. Um, choose your route of administration appropriately. And when you're using a nephrotoxic drug, always dose appropriately, use the shortest course as much as possible and avoid concomitant use of nephrotoxic agents and um, let the, ther the therapeutic drug monitoring guide your, um, uh, your intervals of, antibi uh, of antibiotic use. Certainly just be aware that symptoms are not necessarily a, a sign of a disease or deterioration, um, but it can be as a result of adverse drug reaction to an antibiotics. Review all the medication that your patient is on. And I think this can be a problem uh, for us uh, in a big institute where we've got multiple prescribers and patients come in with incomplete medication lists or even the use of over-the-counter medication. So always encourage your patients when they come into your clinic to bring their brown bag of all the medications that they use. And I think certainly there is no substitute for careful monitoring and good infection control practices in order for us to have successful outcomes. So it's certainly a big topic for such a short period, but I've, I hope I've done justice and thank you very much.